Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, I thought we could do the wave this morning. I thought that would be fun. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome, everyone. It's so good to be together this morning. I just want to highlight for those who are viewing online, through Facebook, YouTube, we are so glad you're joining us, whether you're joining us this morning or joining us later when you're viewing this. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, and that you're being going to be a part of our morning. And so I am, for those of you who haven't met me yet, if you're new, my name is Tracy Linkletter. I am the senior leader here at Summerside Community Church. And at Summerside Community Church, we invite you to follow the way of Jesus. We believe that Jesus is the one that changes everything as we choose to give our lives to him. You know, I was thinking about this this morning... And I shared this in the prayer room, and I shared it on, on uh, the Facebook Live this morning, too. But I was reflecting yesterday. I was in the garden. I was digging in the dirt. I was preparing the soil. And when you prepare the soil, you have to put in manure, fertilizer, um, and prepare the soil for the seed. Now, maybe some of you have noticed the last couple of weeks smells of manure wafting in the air at times. <laughs> so the farmers are getting the soil ready. It's a good thing because it means that growth is coming. And so I was thinking about how that relates to our hearts. The soil of our hearts, we often talk about the garden in our hearts, the soil of our hearts has to be prepared for the seeds that the Holy Spirit plants. And sometimes that preparation can be not as pleasant as we would hope. It can be smelly or messy, but it's worth it. It's worth it because of the growth that comes. And so I want to encourage you this morning to open your hearts to what God wants to do to, to, do to prepare the soil of your hearts. Um, so I just want to encourage you this morning as we step into worship in the Word. And so if you have any questions about what happens this morning, we would love to have that opportunity to have that conversation with you. So please feel free to ask any questions of those who are wearing lanyards. We've got volunteers throughout the building who are wearing lanyards, or myself, um, or Colby, who will be teaching today. We'd Feel free to ask any questions. So in our service today, we're going to be taking communion throughout um, our worship time. We like to mix it up and do it in some different ways, and that's just one way where you can do communion on your own. But I also want to encourage you, if you're with someone today or you want to take communion with someone here, feel free to bring a friend and do communion together and share the meal together. You absolutely can do that, and I'll encourage that. And then Colby Lidstone is sharing our message this morning called Cultural Christians or Burnt Offerings. Very curious. He's been telling me a bit about his message, so I'm very curious about that. And then after our celebration this morning, there'll be a time for coffee and a time to connect. I want to encourage you to hang out and have coffee and get a chance to know maybe someone you don't know very well in the church. It's always a good time. So let's stand together this morning um, and move around a little bit and look for someone you haven't said hello to yet and say hello and welcome them this morning into the house of the Lord. And if you're online this morning, I'll encourage you to send your happiest emoji. Say hello to someone who's online or viewing from online. This morning, um, I want to read to us as we enter into worship from Psalm 11, and or Psalm 100, sorry, Psalm 100, and the first line I'm reading from the message says, on your feet now, applaud God. So let's applaud the Lord this morning. Let's applaud him for his goodness, for who he is. Come on, a little bit louder, a little louder. Woo! All right. Applaud God. Bring a gift of laughter this morning, Caroline. Bring a gift of laughter this morning. <laughs> See, 
bring yourselves into his presence. Know this, God is God and God, God. He made us. We didn't make him. We're his people, his well-tended sheep. Enter with the password, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Make yourselves at home, talking praise. Thank him, worship him, for God is sheer beauty. All generous in love, loyal always and ever. Let us worship him together.
nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you.
holy, holy is the Lamb. I just, as we are worshiping, I just sense this morning, um, as we come into this place of worship, we're in his throne room, and when we come into his presence, we know that so many things fall away. When we just focus on him, so many things can fall off us. And this morning, I just, I sense in this space that there's questions that some of you are carrying, big questions. And I just want to encourage you this morning, I just want to sing this holy, holy refrain again. I want to encourage you this morning just to lift those questions to him. They're questions that maybe don't seem to have a clear answer or a clear understanding to you right now. And I just want to encourage you as you focus on him, just keep your focus on him and let him, just give that question to him. Just give it to him and just declare him as holy. He knows, he sees, and he is the one that we can leave it with. And so this morning, as we can just continue to sing that one more time, let's leave those questions with him. And Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you are the Lamb of God, that you are holy. And God, the hunger and the thirst that we have to know your truth, to know you in full. God, you've said in your word that if we are hungry and thirsty, that you will meet us and that you will fill us. And you alone are what we need. You are alone, the one that can fill those places that are in want and that are in need. You're the one that can meet us in those places. And so we declare you holy. And God, we leave those questions with you and we thank you that you're going to meet us right where we are, right where we are, because you are a God that meets us right where we are. You encounter us right where we are. And you pour your affection and your love right on us, right where we are. And that love and that affection opens doors that nothing else can. It heals like nothing else can. Your love is beyond what we can imagine. It's what we need and what we desire. And so we thank you this morning, Jesus, for your love, for your holiness that you call us into. And we thank you that it's because of you, Jesus, your blood and your body, that we are made right with God, that we are made righteous only because of you, Jesus, only because of you. And so we praise you and give you honor and glory this morning. And we thank you, Father, 
for the affection that you're pouring out on us so that we can become a people, a people of affection, that we can love because you loved us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. I think I see Chesley. Do I see Chesley? Praise the Lord. <laughs> oh, we've been praying for you and for Leslie and your family. It is so good to see you here. Wow, what a gift. What a gift. God is doing some good things. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll get a chance to connect with you after, but this is a, a big deal to see you here. And so we thank the Lord for you and for your family and for what he's been doing and walking with you in that. Bless you guys. So good to see you. So good to see you. Awesome. I'm going to ask Cheryl Millman to make her way up. Um, So we have been praying for Open Door um, Outreach, and we've been uh, also uh, fundraising for them. And so um, this morning, we just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to our community um, for the Perfect. For the, um, for the funds that were raised. So we were able to raise $2,599. Woo! <laughs> Which is a huge blessing to the ongoing ministry of Open Door Outreach in the prison system. And so uh, just know that you are, you are sowing, speaking of, you know, a seed that we talked about earlier this morning, you are sowing a seed into this ministry that the Lord can do so much more with, that he can have things grow that we can't even understand with the seeds that you have planted. So bless you and thank you for your generosity and your giving. And so I wanted to take a moment and um, ask Cheryl, uh, because she's an ongoing part of our community, we love her and the work that she and Neil do. And so we just want to be able to continue to hold them in prayer. And so I wanted Cheryl to share with us what what is something that we can be praying for, for her and Neil. And we're going to take some time and pray. Well, um, first of all, thank you all so much for uh, giving to us. We really appreciate that so much, having um, the connection in the community with churches, especially our own church, and that is uh, just a gift in so many ways. How can you pray for us? Oh, that's a biggie. Um, There's a lot happening right now, a lot that is um, just kind of below the surface, and I get that sense that... uh, when we just keep taking steps out in faith that God is going to reveal, like, open doors for us. And it's hard to explain, but, uh, for instance, we were just in the Summerside uh, Jail this morning that's over at the courthouse, and it's the first time that I have uh, got to see Neil in action, and uh, it's pretty cool. We uh, haven't been able, really, in our whole marriage to minister together in a, a long time, like, just for little periods of time, so it was really cool. And um, so I'll just tell you this one little story that happened this morning. Two of the guys came in. They were from, they had been at the hollow. They had been at chapel with Neil. And do you want to tell the story? Are you sure? Okay. <laughs> She's a better speaker. <laughs> well, you just go. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Save time. Um, so anyway, two guys came. There was eight that who were there and they were very happy that we were there and in the midst of our worship time and whatnot one of the guys began to share that when he was at the hollow uh, he never went to chapel and there was two of the guys in his unit who would come back from chapel and they'd be all bright eyed and happy and they'd say why don't you come to chapel with us he goes no I don't need that stuff I don't need that stuff so finally he was a little interested in uh what was going on in chapel so he started to come and he didn't say how it happened but he said he gave his heart to Jesus didn't he yeah (laughs) see Neil can't talk when we start (laughs) talking about that but yeah it was beautiful because he didn't know anything about it right and he put out papers on the on the table because they were asking how do you how do you become a Christian and so he put papers out on the table for them to take and read and he must have done that or whatever 
I mean, it is such a beautiful thing that we're involved in, and we, we, it feels like we're just on the cusp of something else that's happening, and we're just gonna go with the next right step that we have. So we're really busy right now, and that's good, that's fine, and there's people coming alongside of us. And so I guess the prayer would be that we would have eyes to see what God is doing and then to walk in it, and that we would have the support, the physical support around us to do that as well, because with change comes more needs and, uh, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I guess that's the prayer. Yeah, that's very good. Um, and so, that's so interesting. And we were in the prayer room this morning, that was one of the prayers that we would have as a people, that we would see what the Lord was doing and we'd step into those things. And so, that's very, very cool. The Lord, he's always tying things together and connecting dots in ways we don't understand. And so, this morning, I just, as a, as a family and a community, I just sensed um, we do life relationally. That's very important. And so I would like to pray for you guys as because I believe that you are stepping into something that's new in the season that the Lord has before you. And um, you need to know that your church family is surrounding you. So I just, I want to invite us. So those of you who are connected to uh, Cheryl Neal or just feel a, a pull to come on up Come on up, and I want to surround you guys. So maybe if you want to come here. Um, I just want to encourage you, come on up. Let's lay hands on them as a family, um, as part of just showing our the Father's affection and love as a family. This is, this is the kind of people that we are. And so let's, um, let's surround them um, just to show them uh, our hearts and love. And so this is great. Yeah. So good. And then, and then, if if you want to, uh, just even stretch out your hands uh, in the in the in the seats, and let's just share our love and heart for them. So, um, I am going to pray, but I just I do want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. If there's anyone here that has a prayer rising in them, once I'm done, I will look. <laughs> if anyone wants to, I will hand the mic. So, Father God, I just thank you so much, God, for your just for your love. And God, how you work in beautiful ways, in ways that we don't always comprehend. And you're always inviting and drawing people to you. What a beautiful story this morning of a brother, a new brother in Christ that has given his life to you. And there's, we know there's celebration in heaven this morning. And so, God, uh, I just thank you, Lord, for Neil and Cheryl and for just the open heart they have, God, to step into what you have put in front of them, to step into the call that you've put before them. Um, I'm just reminded of what Jesus said, that the fields are white, ready up to harvest. And Lord, you have called out, and we continue to call out as believers uh, for workers, for workers to step into the harvest. And so as Cheryl has shared, God, will you give them, God, eyes to see what you are doing Will you also give them eyes to see those who you're calling to come alongside them and to walk with them, Lord, in the things that you're putting in front of them. Father, when you call us into something, um, you also equip us and you provide for us in, in the things you call us into. And so I just love Cheryl's request because you, Father, want us to see those things. And so give them eyes and ears to hear, Father. And, um, Lord, continue, Father, to um, just continue to work in their hearts, Father, to prepare them for the work that you have for them. And, Lord, what a gift um, to even be able to see each other ministering in the ways that you've gifted each other. So I pray, God, that you'll continue to strengthen and protect their marriage, Father. Surround them, Lord, with your your heartbeat for each one of them and help them see each other as you see them. And so I just bless them. I bless the ministry, Father. And Lord, we are so thankful for who they are and who you are creating them to be. And we thank you for the work that you're doing through their hearts and through their lives. In Jesus' name. Yeah, Father, we come alongside um, Cheryl and Neil. Um, Lord, and we think of, like Tracy mentioned, the verse, send forth laborers for the harvest is plentiful, Lord. That word send, it's an action move. And Father, as we are praying, I just feel in my spirit this is a sending moment um, that they're already going, but they're going to go even faster and harder and just they're going to be released um, with your uh, an infilling of the Holy Spirit inside of them. Um, Father, we know that you don't already... You don't call those who are equipped. You equip the called. And, Father, I thank you that you continue 
um, to equip Neil and uh, Cheryl and just um, just allow them to experience a deeper well of your presence as they do ministry in, in a very hard place, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I feel this uh, prophetic act that you, too, take a step forward into what God's changing you to become. There's a, a mighty wind blowing on you, too. And uh, he has an amazing uh, field of supporters around you, not just here, but everywhere. And so, Lord, I just ask as they take a, a step forward into the new and the unknown, Lord, that we would be able to support them and pray for them as you would lay them on our hearts. And I ask for a greater cloud of witnesses that the, in this province of Prince Edward Island would rally around them yes. to heal the brokenhearted. Yes. And actually, I get the word raise the dead. Yes. <laughs> so in Jesus' name, I just declare that over you, Cheryl and Neil. Cheryl O'Neill, I just want to bless you in what God is calling you to. And he says, come follow me first and foremost. And I heard the word partnership. And I said, Holy Spirit, what does that say? What are you saying? He said that he, you are partnering with me. And you are partnering with me, the Holy Spirit. And you will hear with ears to hear my, my call, my, what, my direction and what I want you to do. So you hear together in partnership and also that partnership I'm saying is for the marriage as well the partnership in marriage because you are one one together for his kingdom so I want to bless you in that in Jesus name so father we thank you we thank you that we get to uh, bless our brother and sister and that we um yeah, I get to continue to pray for them, Father. So I pray, Lord, as we go from this time of prayer, Father, that you continue to draw our attention, um, Lord, to be praying for and lifting up and surrounding Neil and Cheryl, Father, and the things that you have for them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God is good. He's so good. And so I'm going to invite Colby Lidstone to make his way up um, this morning. He is, um, you know, he's very excited about his message. We were chatting about it this week. And uh, the Lord has been teaching him and showing him some cool things. Um, and so the title of his message is Cultural Christians or Burnt Offerings. And so, Colby, we thank the Lord for you. Uh, we thank him for um, just the way he has formed you and uh, the way that he speaks to you. And so we look forward to what the Father wants to impart from you this morning. So bless you, Colby. Aaron, can we get some lights up? I... Thanks. Good. What a good morning. I am... Um... My knees are a little weak this morning, and I don't know if it's because I played tennis or it's the Holy Spirit, but we're going to go with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna, just going to jump right in um, this morning. If you want to open your Bibles, we're going to be in two verses today. That's pretty well it. Uh, we're going to be in First Peter um, two, four, and five. So if it's going to be on the screen, but if you want, some people like paper, they want to underline and do different things. Um, so yeah, I'll just wait a few seconds for those of you with paper Bibles. All right, we'll go. It says, First Peter 2, 4, 5, As you come to him, the living stone, Rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, 
offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Since this is the verse we're going to spend a lot of time in today, I want to read it once more just so it, we can really get it in our hearts and our brains this morning. It says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So here, Peter, in 1 Peter 2, in 1 Peter, he's composing a message, and he's writing a letter to early church believers. And what he's writing them, he's writing them to um, address their situation that they're in of heavy persecution from the Roman Empire. They have been driven out of the public square and they're unable to practice their Christianity and their belief in Jesus without publicly facing persecution. They've, they've, they, they could have been forced out of their homes, their cities. They're essentially on the run and scattered throughout all of Asia Minor. So as you can imagine, being an early Christian, being an early believer under this type of persecution, and being scattered from your homes, many of them are genuinely beginning to suffer and struggle to hold on to their faith in this situation. Can you imagine, aren't we blessed to live in Canada where we can practice our faith? We shouldn't take this for granted. Here in the early church, they're under severe persecution and they're scattered all around, yet they're still attempting to maintain and hold on to their faith in Christ. So Peter, as the church father, that he is. He says, I'm going to write you a letter for the purpose of giving you hope and to help the church in the midst of your situation. And what he does, he begins to preach a message affirming the identity of the church. Because how many of you know when you're under great pressure, when you're under distress, when you're under attack, when you're struggling, it is easy to forget who you are. You're so consumed with what's happening around you. So Peter, as the father, he says, I want to come to I want to come alongside you, even in your struggle, even in your pain. I want to encourage you, not by just telling you everything's gonna be okay, but by reminding you of who you are. So let's go back and read 1 Peter 2, 4, and 5 once more now that we have this understanding of where they are and the lens that Peter's writing. He says to them, as you come to him, as you come to Jesus in this present circumstance, in the challenge that you're facing, as you come to him, the living stone that was rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves are like living stones. You're being built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I want to give you kind of the big idea or the summary of what I think Peter is saying here. And we're going to put it up on screen. The church is the place for God's presence and we are the priests for his worship. I want to say once more, the church is the place for God's presence and we are the priests for his worship. I'm going to deal with those two ideas in a minute, but I want to frame kind of what P Peter is bringing out of here. And he says, as you come to him, why don't you say it with me? As you come, say it once more, as you come, as you come, as you come to him, the living stone, it's interesting, I'm not nowhere a Greek scholar, 
okay? I'm not. I'm, there's your honest opinion. I can barely speak English on a good day. But come to him, apparently in my research, it's a, it's a Greek tense. And it, what it means is ongoing and continuous. It would be like saying if, if I still had my poor dog Sam who died a long time ago. But, you know, rest in peace. It was like if I chose to love Sam at the beginning, and then I continued to choose to love Sam even when he would on the floor. I chose to love him in the beginning and the end. I didn't just choose to like him in the beginning and, oh, let's see how it goes from there. No, I chose to love in the beginning. There was a moment I engaged, I committed, and I will continue to commit until the poor thing died. That's the kind of coming to Jesus that Peter is speaking of. He says, even in the midst of your struggle, I want you to remember something. Just like you came to Jesus that first time, you have to continue coming to Jesus. It's not a one and done, check it, woo, we're done. Yes, I can move on. What's next on the list? No, it's a, okay, I've met the risen king. I've met the Messiah. What's next? Oh, I have to meet him again. Nice to meet you. I'm, oh, another, it's another day. I need to meet him again. As you come to him, it's a constant daily thing of getting and meeting Jesus. So first, the church is the place for the presence of God. First Peter 2, uh, 5 explains that as you come to Jesus, we are like living stones being built into a spiritual house. The term house, again, I was wondering, what does house even mean back then? The Greek means family, dwelling place. So Peter reassures believers that they are being built into this house, into a place where God's presence will manifest on earth. And this is really encouraging for them. Because they're currently, remember, scattered all over the place. And they're unable to gather in a building. So Peter tells them to hold on and understand that they have become the temple of God. The church is no longer just a physical structure, but a spiritual house built with living stones. And it includes everyone. Everyone is now the dwelling place of God's presence. Pastor Jensen Franklin describes it like this. In the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. But in the New Testament, God has a people for his temple. The location has changed, and now believers themselves are the living stones that are made up to be the dwelling place of the Most High. But it's important to note that while we, be, can be, we can experience God's presence personally. There's a unique measure of his presence that can only be encountered in a corporate setting of believers, in a group of believers. And I think we have this false idea of what church actually means. That we're thinking uh, what church means is we have to fill every seat in the building. But that's not what church means. Church means where a group of people are gathered in his presence. Whether it be two or three, a hundred, six hundred, whatever. It's just a group of people in his presence that are living as living, as, as living stones. Peter's teaching is clear. Do not be discouraged or dismayed, for God is actively constructing you 
into living stones to become the dwelling place of the Most High. Psalms 22.3 says that God abides and is enthroned on the praises of his people. The church gathering is where we go to experience God's presence and to begin to encounter his, him in a manifested corporate way. It's totally different than, you know, I'm not saying you can't experience God personally, strongly in your bedroom at home. But I just, I don't even know the word for it. But I just know that when believers come together, it's different. It's different. It's encouraging. It's encouraging. Looking back at history, we see that God had chosen to draw to us. At first, his presence resided in the Garden of Eden when he created the heavens and the earth. And he intended for Adam and Eve to enjoy his presence. But then sin caused a separation between us and God. But this marked the beginning of God's mission and purpose to draw us closer to him. The Bible tells us that his presence then dwelled in the Ark of the Covenant. That was inside the tabernacle of Moses. And people could still worship and offer their sacrifices. But it had to be done through a priest who entered the inner courts. And although it was a good system, it was not perfect. And God desired to draw even closer to his people. So then his presence rested in the tent of David where a continuous sacrifice and worship were offered around the clock. Yet that wasn't even enough for God. He had a greater plan, so he decided to come in the form of his son Jesus, who was known as Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus' presence was tangible. It, he was flesh, he was bone, he was God. Isn't that a cute Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, he walked with his disciples for three years. He lived with them. But he was still only limited to one space, which was not sufficient for God's ultimate purpose. Therefore, he sent his son to die on the cross, paying the price for our sins. Jesus conquered death. And the veil in the temple showing, up, showing the separation between God and humanity, it was torn from top to bottom. And this shows us the end of the separation. It shows us that God's people now had access to his presence. And then, as everyone knows, charismatics love this part. Acts chapter 2. The church gathered in the upper room. They were praying and believing for God's promise. And then the Holy Spirit came upon them like a rushing wind, and the church expanded quickly. And ordinary people, Jews and Gentiles, they became vessels for the dwelling of the Almighty. But Peter encountered some Jewish believers who still held on to the notion, the idea that a specific building was necessary to experience God's presence. And Peter declares that the era, the, the time of relying on a building is over. That believers, that people themselves have become the spiritual house as they continually come to Christ, even in the face of persecution and challenges, they are being built up into a larger structure capable of fully embracing God's presence in their lives. I want to be someone. I want to be a container. I want to be a vessel I want to be built up to hold God's presence more fully. I want to be someone who stands the test of time. 
I want to be someone unwavering in my faith. I want to be someone who continues to trust God in the, even in the face of struggles. I want to be the person at 85 or 90 years old and looks back and says, I never gave up. And because of that, I have experienced God's presence and dwelling. That's the person I aspire to be. We are the dwelling place for God's presence. We are the priests for his worship. We are not just a place to be filled, but we are the place that's filled to be used. God doesn't just fill you. He fills you and spills you. Just like in the Garden of Eden, he gave them this garden this beautiful place, this place with his presence. But then what did he do? He gave them a purpose in the garden. And the same is true for the church. He pours his spirit out on us, not so that we can do nothing, but so that we expand his kingdom throughout the earth and become priests who offer him praise. We are a holy priesthood. Look at verse 5 where it says you're being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood whose job is to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. Historically, only priests had direct access to God and were allowed to offer worship. If you wanted to express gratitude or thanks, you had to bring your sacrifice to a priest, but that's not the case anymore. Now the church is the priesthood. You can bring your worship directly to God. We have been given the job of bringing our worship to the Lord. So what does that look like for believers of today? People who only know one certain way of worship. I think we can look back at the Old Testament to see how he used sacrifices to teach a new way of worshiping Christ. In the Old Testament, there were five offerings, two of which were atoning of sin and forgiveness. If you wanted to offer worship to God, you first had to offer these two sacrifices. Then you could offer the three other sacrifices as acts of gratitude and, and, um, and love. But Jesus has forever atoned for our sins. So we don't have to offer those sacrifices anymore. All the worship we offer as the church is up to us. We express our thankfulness and gratitude to the Lord. And let me tell you, you don't have to show up on a Sunday morning. But if you want to offer gratitude and thanks to the Lord, show up with a song in your heart. Joyfully expressing your faith. This way you can express gratitude and thankfulness to Jesus. This is why we worship. It's not out of obligation. It's not out of getting acceptance. It's, it's, it's not to get God's attention because we already have it. We worship out of a grateful heart saying, God, because you are so good, and you've made me a dwelling place for your presence. Let me return my gratitude and my thankfulness to you. These three sacrifices, the burnt offering, the grain offering, and the fellowship offering. You see, the burnt offering is, is not for sin or forgiveness. Jesus has already taken that. This, this offering is the act of worship and gratitude. The word burnt offering literally means to rise up or offer up. It's like throwing up your hands. It's like when you light a campfire at first and the smoke rises. It's an offering to the Lord. The burnt offering shows the consumption of the offering itself. It's interesting. In ancient worship practices, it was believed that when an offering was burnt and the smoke rose, God was literally consuming or eating the offering. So the, uh, the offering shows giving and receiving, ev releasing everything to God. 
knowing that he was fully con- that he will fully consume that he will fully receive that he will fully accept our worship this is the idea behind the burnt offering and it brings clarity to Hebrews chapter 12 where it says therefore since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken let us be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. This scripture means that God will consume, God will receive and accept the worship we offer to him. When people brought their offerings to be burnt and released into God, it was, a, it was a symbol of, I'm giving everything I have to you. Everything I have is fully yours. There were three aspects, this three ideas to understand about the burnt offering. First, the offering had to be a bull, a ram, or a bird. All three were received with the same value. Whether you were rich, poor, middle class, it didn't matter because you had something of worth and value to offer God. Everyone can worship because it's not about the amount you give, but in the heart you give it. God loves a cheerful giver, not someone who gives out of force. He's not impressed by quantity, but by the heart behind the gift. The second aspect is that when you brought the animal for the offering, you were saying, God, just as I'm giving this to you, everything I have belongs to you. This is why believers give the first 10% of their income to Christ. It's a way of showing that God is in charge of everything by obeying with the amount he has called us to give. This is a total surrender, saying, God, you have all of me. And the third part, this is my favorite. The third part is that they would absolutely would not let the fire go out or take anything off the altar until every piece of the animal was completely burnt or consumed. They wouldn't say, well, it's burnt enough. Let's take off the bones and leave some meat on for later. No, they didn't do that. No, they they wouldn't remove any of the offering until it was fully consumed. Why? Because it reflected, God, you have all of me. There's nothing for me to hold back from you. So when Peter says, listen, we're not offering sacrifices like we used to. We're now offering spiritual sacrifices. This is important because worship isn't just some spontaneous emotions and feelings and goosebumps. Worship isn't bringing, worship is bringing something of substance to God. We are flesh and bone. We are people of substance. Our worship isn't just smoke, emotions, feelings. What makes a sacrifice spiritual? What makes worship spiritual is when you are prompted and led by the Holy Spirit to offer something in your life. So when we come and we sing songs, we do it because the Spirit is leading us to sing. When we give our money, it's because the Holy Spirit empowers us and leads us to give. When we serve others and give our time and energy, we're not just doing it because we're good people. We're doing it because we're led and empowered by the Holy Spirit to do it. This is what offering spiritual sacrifices looks like. I want to draw a picture that I hope will help you understand how a burnt offering is offered to the Lord as worship. Because I know all of us desire to worship and give our best to God. But sometimes, like me, you're not always sure what to give or what God wants. Well, this is what God wants. He wants a burnt offering. So when a person would bring a ram, a bull, a bird, they would lay it on the altar to be consumed This is what they knew they were doing on the inside. When they offered the head of the animal, the head always represents authority in your life. By offering the head of the animal to be consumed, they were saying, God, you are the authority in my life. I'm not in charge of my life. I'm yielding. I'm surrendering to you. 
I'm offering you, you the authority of my life that belongs to you. When they would offer the outward parts of the animal, the skin over the animal that represents the outward behavior of our lives, they would say, God, I, the way I act, the way I look, the way I conduct myself, all that belongs to you. I'm offering you the outward parts of my life for you to be Lord over. When they would offer the legs of the animal, legs always represents direction and future. They would say, God, I'm offering you the legs of of this animal because I'm telling you right now that you get to decide my future. You get to decide my direction. God, I'm no longer the captain of my own ship. I'm yielding and surrendering right now for your future, your destiny for my life. When they would offer the fat of the animals, fat represents wealth, luxury, abundance. When they would burn the fat of the animal on the altar, they were saying, God, everything that you have given me is yours. All my resources, all my abundance, I recognize that every good and perfect thing comes from you, and, I, and you entrusted it to me, and I'm giving it back to you. I'm offering you the fat of my life. How many of you have any fat to offer? I got a little bit. This is kind of gross, but it's important. The insides of the animals were offered to represent that everything inside of me also submits to you. My attitude, my emotions, my thought life, my motives, my heart. I'm not just going to be someone who looks like a Christian on the outside. I'm going to be someone who, just, who doesn't just say what should be heard. I'm going to not just lift up my hands to appear holy. No, I want to be pierced. I want to be penetrated. I want you to access all those other areas in my life. I'm offering you the inside parts of who I am, where all my guilt is stored up, where all my shame is stored up, all those things I've tried to hide and keep in the darkness. God, that's yours. I give you every part of who I am. You can have everything inside of me. And they would burn it all. They wouldn't take anything off. Even the blood would burn, representing life. That's when we realize that I live and I move and I have my being. And God alone is the, sub, the substance, the author, the beginning, the end, the everything. I offer all that I am. See, when they would bring a bull a ram, a bird, it wasn't just paying their dues and moving on. No, it represented an entire yielding and surrendering of their life to God because it, God says, I just don't want 20 minutes from you on a Sunday morning. I just don't want you to show up on a Thursday night to youth group. I just don't want 30 minutes in the morning when you're listening to Spotify. That's all good. But I want everything you have. I want the authority. I want the direction. I want your inward thoughts. I want your wealth. I want it all. Do you want to offer me a burnt offering? Yield it all to me. This brings much clearer understanding to why Paul in chapter 12 of Romans, he says this is your reasonable act of worship. Remember the first 11 chapters of Romans, Paul is bringing understanding and clarity to the gospel of Christ and to what Jesus did for us. And then all of a sudden, in chapter 12, he says, Therefore, in the view of all these things that God has done, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is what's holy and acceptable and your spiritual worship. Church, worshiping God is not just an activity. It's you. Church, worshiping God is not just an activity. It's you. It's giving yourself fully to the Lord. I want to invite Heather and the team up as we close. I want to point something out to you. We read three scriptures today. Romans 12.1, Hebrews 12.28, and 1 Peter 2. I want you to see the common theme that comes out when it comes to worship. 
Romans 12, 1 says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual worship. Hebrews 12, 28 says, worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. In 1 Peter 2, our key scripture, it says we offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The reality is there are acceptable and unacceptable ways to worship. You can't just worship God however you want and expect him to receive it as worship. God has acceptable ways to be praised. And I often wonder to myself, how often am I doing something that I think God is accepting fully, but he isn't receiving it the way I think he is. I realize that there is acceptable and unacceptable worship. I want to be someone who's faithful to say, God, I see how you, what you love. I see what you like. And that's how I'm going to respond. I'm not just going to try to offer you my best thoughts of what worship is and then hope you just take it. No, I'm going to find out what you want, and that's what I'm going to offer you because you're worthy of it. You know, the number one way, and really the only way that worship is accepted by God is through Jesus Christ. What does it say in 1 Peter 2? We offer spiritual sacrifices through Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because apart from Jesus, our best is like dirty underwear. And God doesn't want our dirty underwear. Nobody does. And that's all that you are going to give him. He sent his son Jesus to live the life you could not live, to die the death that you should have died, and then defeat death and hell in a way you could never so that Think about this. We can bring our behavior, both good and bad. God, I don't have much to bring to you, but here it is. In worship, we can bring our pleasures, our joys, our thoughts, our emotions, our ambitions, our goals, and we offer everything to God. But we do it in Jesus Christ because Jesus is what makes worship acceptable to God. It's so easy for us, and maybe it's just me. Maybe you're like me, and you walk into moments of worship like this, and stuff starts going th- through your head. Does God want any of this from me? I mean, goodness gracious, I lost my temper. I went back to the thing I never thought I'd go back to. What do I have to offer God of any worth? And then we might start playing the comparison game, which the Bible says is unwise. We walk in and we think, look at Jack and Shirley leading and serving longer than I've been alive. What an incredible offering they can bring to him. What an incredible offering they get to bring to him. Or how about this, you and your spouse, you say, honey, let's go, we're going to church. And then you yell at your kids the whole ride. And you come in trying to put a smiling face on, but deep down you're thinking, oh my goodness, what a horrible drive. And you look over at the other couple with the perfect marriage, and wow, what an incredible offering they get to bring to the Lord. What do I have I feel like a hypocrite right now. Does God even want anything from me today? I have no faith. I'm constantly scared. I'm full of anxiety. What can I even bring to God? So many times we are stopped from offering worship that we should bring to the Lord because we think we are offering it to him in our own dysfunction and worth. But really what we do is we come to Jesus and lay it at the altar. We say, God, you can have all of me. You can have the outward parts. You can have the inward parts. You can have my future, my past, my hopes, my dreams. You can have it all. I give it all to you, Jesus. And in that moment, 
it becomes like a sweet fragrance to the Father because he sees acceptable worship that's coming through his Son, Jesus. The church should never be stopped from worshiping because of shame. God took that away. We no longer need to be prevented from offering worship because of guilt, doubt, anxiety. Why? Because Jesus already paid that. We don't need to come before the Lord and hide our dysfunction. We don't need to come before the Lord and cover ourselves up and clean ourselves up before we come to Jesus. That's what Adam and Eve did. They realized their sin, they hid from God, and they tried to cover themselves with leaves. But what happened? God called them out of hiding. He clothed them. And God did the same with the church, but he did it even better through Jesus Christ. He covers us with the blood of Jesus so that when he looks at us, he doesn't see us in our dysfunction. He sees us through the blood of his son who made us right, not by our own works, but by our trust and faith in him. So there's no more hiding, no more covering, no more cleaning ourselves up. By faith in Jesus Christ, we can finally worship God in spirit and in truth because we're giving God a burnt offering, which is all of us. We don't take anything back. We don't hold anything on to ourselves. Instead, we say, God, have all of me. Because it's through Jesus Christ that the church has become the place for God's dwelling presence. And we have become the priests, the people who are now worthy through Jesus Christ to offer him the worship that he deserves. So this morning, I just want to take a moment and gather as the church, as the body of believers. And just I'm praying that there will be an infilling of the Holy Spirit this morning, that people will experience the presence of God in greater ways than they ever experienced, that there would be a fire lit this morning. I was having a conversation with a friend last night about how it should not be the church that determines the fire with inside of you. Your fire should come from Jesus himself. So many of us go to a church and we say, oh, this place is spiritually dead, and then you feel spiritually dead. That means your spirit, your fire is coming from the church. Instead, your fire should be coming from the one who fills you with the fire, with the passion, with the Holy Spirit. So this morning, if you want to receive some fire this morning, come on up. I want to pray for you right now. Come on up. I just feel the Holy Spirit is going to fill people this morning with an even greater fire that they will become the priests of the church, that they will bring the burnt offering of their lives, that they will bring all they have. So if that's you, come on up this morning. And we're just going to, I'm just going to lace, we're going to invite some people to lay hands, and we're just going to worship God this morning. A little bit longer. I'm running early. So anyone else, come on up. Come on up. I just feel the Holy Spirit wants to impart his spirit into people. If you've already received the Holy Spirit, he wants to give you more passion. If you haven't received the Holy Spirit, he wants to, you to receive it this morning. So if that's you, just put your hands out this morning in a place of receiving like it's a gift. It is a gift. If someone was giving you the gift, you'd have your hands out. This is the greatest gift you could ever receive. Thank you, Jesus. If there's anybody else, come on up. Holy, holy. We're just going to sing one more song together. And I'm just going to lay hands this morning. And we're going to pray for a baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.